name is Moises Rendon. I'm the director of the Future of Venezuela Initiative and Fellow of the Americas Program. I would like to welcome those watching online as well. For the record, this event is being recorded and will be available after the event finishes. Uh, today's topic, uh, topic is critical to understand the depth of the Venezuelan crisis. Maduro, following former President Hugo Chavez's legacy, fostered the creation of a criminalized state in Venezuela that uses transnational organized crime as an instrument of state power. I think one of the best reports I've seen about this issue come from Doug Farrell and Kathleen Yates, uh, the title Maduro's Last Stand. According to the report, which after five years of field work, the Venezuelan state is part of a consortium of criminalized actors working in concert with other states and other non-state actors with shared objective. So the ongoing criminal activities in Venezuela include money laundering, drug trafficking, human trafficking, illegal mining, um, and, and that also includes the role of foreign nations and non-state actors in the territory, right? So, so the breadth of these criminal activities helps demonstrate why maybe the Maduro regime remains in power despite stiff international and domestic pressure. So this is why we are hosting this event, just to shed light on this issue. I think it's a critical one to understand better how can we get there to, to, to a democratic Venezuela moving forward. Um, so again, we're gonna be discussing the implications of armed groups in Venezuela and how they affect a transition process and the policy options that the US, Colombia, and other international actors have to respond to this. Before the panel of experts, we are honored to introduce three colleagues who are working and representing very important countries and institutions on this, on this issue. We will hear from Paul Aher, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary and Assistant General Counsel at the US Treasury Department. Paul has served at the Treasury for the past seven years, including in key positions within the Enforcement and Intelligence Unit. Prior to Treasury, he was a trial attorney for the Department of Justice and a military officer in the U.S. Army. Thank you, Paul. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you. Before Paul, we will hear from the High Commissioner of Peace from, from the Colombian government, Miguel Ceballos, and the Colombian ambassador Francisco, uh, to the U.S., uh, Francisco Santos. And they both have a very impressive government and academic uh, background. We're very honored to have... Uh, such a close collaboration with, with Colombia on this issue because, again, this is not a Venezuela issue. This is a shared uh, uh, issue that Colombia and other countries in the region should be paying close attention. And so thank you, Ambassador, for being here. Thank you, Mr. Ceballos, for joining us via video. We, we understand you were planning to be here in person, but for circumstances out of your control, uh, you couldn't make it. So, But we're honored to have you via video as well. Colombian Ambassador, thank you. The floor is yours, and then we go to Mr. Ceballos. Thank you, Moisés. This uh, conversation, which I think is very important, and I'm going to go to, uh, uh, like, Star, like Star Trek used to say, a place where nobody has been before. Or we have been before, but I think it's important to look a little bit at the historical context of what is happening here. Uh, and very quickly, um, we cannot talk about the illegal groups in Venezuela without talking about Cuba, about the history of Cuba in the region. Cuba is in existence. <coughs> the survival of the Maduro regimes right now is, in a, is an existential issue for, the, for, 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 for Cuba, for Cuban economy, and for the survival of the present regime in Cuba. Um, when you look at what Cuba has done in the region in the past 60 years, it's very important to understand why they did it, how they did it, and it, it, it's an element in this equation that has to be uh, understood very, very clearly. Not only during the 60s with the revolution uh, did they uh, try to uh, install a similar government in Bolivia with El Che, but they uh, were uh, principal promoters of the ELN in Colombia. As a matter of fact, uh, two of the brothers, founding brothers of the ELN live in Cuba. I don't know if both have survived, Fabio Vasquez uh, Castaño and his brother, and Antonio. <clears throat> we have to go back also to, um, to the um, mid-80s, when early, uh, late 70s, early 80s, when President Turbay from Colombia broke relations with Cuba because of their support of the M19. 
Uh, and I think this is a trend that has, uh, for di different reasons and different uh, historical circumstances, the Cold War, uh, the sanctions by the US, uh, et cetera, et cetera, it's a, a playmaking type of, uh, of uh, political decision that started when they created El Departamento Americas under Barbarroja, one of the, one of the historic uh, members of, uh, of, of the Cuban government. Uh, so to try to understand how to deal with this problem, we have to definitely put Cuba in the equation. We definitely have to understand that this is something that has gone beyond just a security issue, which is very difficult, and, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Ceballos is going to talk about it, but also a geostrategic um, story. Russia, Cuba, uh, and Venezuela are playing with cards that we have seen in other regions of the world. As a matter of fact, uh, there's discussion within the ELN about the Hezbollah type of um, strategy. So, so what we have here in the region is a, a continental threat. What we have in the region is a geostrategic threat. And what we have in the region is uh, something that uh, will, um, will be a big problem for all of us during decades. What uh, Maduro has done with the ELN in giving them the use of the mines, in helping them control territorial, ter ter uh, the border, etc., in extracting resources and strengthening them is something that, uh, that is not, uh, even if the Maduro government uh, uh, is, um, is gone, is going to be a, a difficult uh, situation for the, the government that come forward. But uh, what I wanted to pinpoint is that in this equation of how do we challenge, what would the reaction be? I think it's important to have Cuba in the horizon. I think it's important that we understand what Cuba, how Cuba operates, what their interests are, and, uh, and how they can play this game one way or another. We certainly thought that when President Obama opened the door to Cuba in, in early this decade, they would become good neighbors in the region. Not only did they do so, they did not do so, but uh, they have uh, further strengthened their ties to, uh, to the Venezuelan regime, and they have further strengthened their ties to, uh, to Maduro and the illegal organization. So, so I, um, during the discussions, I would uh, encourage uh, many of the panelists to talk about how to deal with this issue that is uh, extracontinental, that has continental, a continental framework, and that without a doubt has a, a, is of critical importance uh, to the Cuban government. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Okay, Mr. Ceballos, are you there? I don't see you in the room, but um, I was told that he's ready to provide remarks. Okay, maybe while we wait for, for Mr. Ceballos, um, Paul, we're gonna turn to you. If you don't mind providing the remarks, and then we, we hope to have Ceballos after. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here this morning. Um, as you heard from my biography, uh, much of my early uh, government career focused on counterterrorism. When I came to Treasury about a decade ago, I think uh, we were focused on things like Iran and counterterrorism, that sort of thing. I, I don't think I would have imagined that we would uh, uh, spend as much time as we do on Venezuela, but in fact, it is one of our most active uh, sanctions programs. And so what I'd like to talk a little bit about this morning is both what we're sort of seeing on the ground uh, in Venezuela. Um, you'll, you'll see, and I think as the ambassador uh, sort of previewed, um, you know, those, those traditional threats in terms of terrorists and uh, Iranian proxies actually show up again in Venezuela, and it's something that we're trying to counter. And I'll, I'll also talk a little bit about um, uh, Treasury's role and what we're doing with respect to, to Venezuela. So as I said, Venezuela is one of our most active sanctions programs. Um, since 2017, we've targeted over 220 individuals and entities, and we're working closely with central banks, finance ministries, law enforcement agencies, uh, and financial intelligence units throughout the world and the region uh, to identify and freeze the assets of corrupt Maduro regime officials and their support networks so that the, uh, the government, the legitimate government of Juan Guaido can begin a process of asset recovery. Uh, as part of our pressure efforts, Treasury has designated the Central Bank of Venezuela 
uh, and a number of other government institutions because of how Maduro has exploited those institutions uh, for his and his cronies' personal gain. Um, in August, the president issued an executive order that blocked the entire government of Venezuela, uh, which is not a, a common thing that we do. We sort of reserve that, uh, that particular sanction for the most, the most odious uh, uh, national security threats. Um, it's been well publicized, I think, and this, this, uh, this illustrates why I think that the, uh, the Maduro regime is particularly odious, um, that he uses hunger as a weapon and control of humanitarian aid, in particular the so-called CLAP program, uh, it, he uses to enrich himself and his cronies. Um, so to, to highlight how we're going after that particular threat, uh, Treasury sanctioned Alex Saab, who's a key front man for the regime, orchestrating a whole vast network of corruption that has enabled Maduro and his regime to significantly profit from food imports and distribution in Venezuela. Uh, through a sophisticated network of shell companies, business partners, and family members, Saab blundered hundreds of millions of dollars in corrupt proceeds around the world. The corruption network that operates the CLAP program is using food as a form of social control to reward political supporters and punish opponents, all while pocketing hundreds of millions of dollars um, for the benefit of, of Maduro and his inner circle. Um, the ambassador had spoke a little bit about uh, uh, the role that Cuba has played. And I think we, we also agree that Cuba has played a direct role in fomenting repression and violence in Venezuela. The Maduro regime, in, indeed, continues to rely on Cuba's playbook of repression and torture to remain in power. Cuba is one of his key partners uh, propping up this illegitimate regime. He's allowed Cuban agents to infiltrate, influence, and assert control over Venezuela's security forces and other institutions. And in addition, uh, the United States views interference from the Russian government and their support of the Maduro regime as extremely troublesome and unacceptable. President Trump has made clear to Russia that they must leave and renounce their support of the Maduro regime. Um, in terms of malign actors within Venezuela, we, we see that Venezuela is increasingly being used as a safe haven by criminal and terrorist organizations, including the FARC and the ELN. They use Venezuelan territory to engage in illicit activity and undermine regional stability. Uh, the State Department. Well, the State Department. As the State Department has reported, uh, the majority of drugs transiting Venezuela last year were destined for the Caribbean, Central America, and the United States, West Africa, and Europe. And Colombian drug trafficking organizations um, facilitate these, these transshipments through Venezuela. This uh, narco-trafficking uh, is one of the ways that the Maduro regime uh, continues to sort of support itself. So they obviously play a key role in facilitating narco-trafficking in the region. Uh, that activity in and through Venezuela has increased over 50% while Maduro and his cronies line their pockets in partnership with illicit narco-trafficking. Uh, the ELN and FARC dissident groups have safe haven and sanctuary in Venezuela where they operate and uh, destabilize the region. As the ambassador also mentioned, um, more recently Maduro and his regime have turned to gold mining uh, with the support of criminal organizations as they seek new means by which to finance um, uh, themselves, especially in light of the U.S. sanctions that are in place. Um, in response, Treasury has sanctioned the Venezuelan state-run uh, Ferris Metals Mining Company for operating in the country's gold sector, and we will continue to target in that area. The mining and, and sale of gold has been one of uh, the regime's most lucrative financial schemes in recent years. Hundreds of thousands of miners have mined for gold in dangerous makeshift mines in southern Venezuela, all of which are controlled by the Venezuelan military, which in turn corruptly charges criminal organizations for access. And so you see, you see this intersection of uh, you know, narco-trafficking, um, terrorist organizations, criminal organizations, all sort of working to, uh, to finance the Maduro regime. Um, just as, a, as an aside, uh, you know, this is, not, this is not just a problem of crime and corruption. The miners and their communities are exposed to significant environmental abuses because dangerous toxic elements like mercury are used in the mining process, uh, which is sort of, um, you know, obviously affecting their health and affecting the, uh, the environment uh, of Venezuela. Uh, finally, you know, I, I had mentioned kind of the, the traditional, I think, uh, national security threats that when I came to Treasury a decade ago we were facing. Um, 
you, you, you see in Venezuela that they are allowing terrorist organizations to operate there. Um, also Iranian proxies. Uh, Maduro has turned to Hezbollah in particular for political support. And this year we've seen members of Maduro's regime meet with top Hezbollah officials, including the group's leader Hassan Nasrallah and Hezbollah official Mohammed Rad. Uh, tre Treasury designated Rod, uh, who like Nasrallah is a member of the, uh, the Shura Council of Hezbollah, the, and that's the, the terrorist organization's top decision-making body. Um, but in 2019, Rod, the, uh, the designated member of Hezbollah, headed a delegation of Hezbollah officials to meet with members of Maduro's regime at the Venezuelan embassy in Lebanon. And speaking on behalf of Nasrallah, they publicly declared Hezbollah's support for the Maduro regime. Subsequent to that meeting, we also saw Maduro's illegitimate foreign minister, uh, Jorge Areza, travel to Lebanon to meet with Nasrallah himself. And I want to underscore, uh, you know, I, I don't think, I don't think this, uh, this group would, uh, would be under a misimpression um, that there is some kind of a distinction between Hezbollah's political arm and their uh, uh, terrorist or militaristic arm. Uh, but there is no distinction between those two. Hezbollah uses its political power to conceal and advance its terrorist agenda undermining the safety and stability of Lebanon and threatening the peace and security of innocent civilians around the world. Uh, this is as true today as it was a decade ago, but it's, I, think it's, I think it's significant that, um, you know, as, as the pressure on the Maduro regime continues to increase, he finds himself turning to these groups like Hezbollah uh, to support him. Uh, the Maduro regime's ties to Cuba, Russia, and criminal and terrorist groups obviously should concern the entire international community as they prop up the government, stand in the way of peaceful transition to democracy, and present a threat to regional stability. Uh, I think just one, one final word I wanted to, to make about, uh, or final comment I want to make about the humanitarian crisis. Um, as Maduro continues to plunder what is left of Venezuela's resources and you know, that, that includes the, uh, uh, the illicit mining and the environmental damage that that, that uh, entails. The humanitarian crisis deepens and the countries of the region bear the costs of the Maduro reg uh, regime's failure. We're committed to ensuring that humanitarian support can flow to the Venezuelan people. Um, our sanctions are meant to target Maduro and his regime, not innocent Venezuelans. And we work very hard, in fact, with respect to the targeting uh, to ensure that, uh, that, that that is the case. The U.S. government will continue to use all of our available economic and diplomatic tools against those who support Maduro and his cronies, harm the lives of ordinary Venezuelans through corruption or aid and support individuals and entities who have already been sanctioned. Uh, so I look forward to the, uh, to the discussion later on today. I think it's a very important topic because, as I said, uh, the, the, the more pressure that seems to be exerted on the Maduro regime, more and more they start turning to uh, malign actors who I think uh, present a security threat to the entire international community. And so, uh, very interested in, in hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner Ceballos. Thank you for joining us. We're delighted to have you. Um, can you listen to us? We, we can't well, hear yeah. you. Can you turn you, you the hear me? No. Yeah, that's better. Are you hear me now? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm sorry Thank about you. the delay. I was uh, in the middle of a meeting. So we were eager to hear your thoughts on this issue and, and, and keep going. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, and thanks to CSIS for, for this opportunity. Uh, the Colombian government position is quite clear. We are uh, very concerned about
support is quite uh, clear for our intelligence and uh, for um, uh, the international community. Uh, this is very important to go on on very specific and concrete actions. Uh, our president uh, and our minister of foreign affairs are um, uh, have uh, are, are, uh, always uh, are in talking about uh, the sanctions against Venezuela through uh, the um, uh, activation of a uh, resolution 1373 of 2001. This resolution is very important because uh, it, it, it bans uh, any country that is part of the United States of the United Nations to support terrorist groups and to support terrorist acts. So for us, it's quite important to go on on the activation of uh, this uh, resolution. I repeat, resolution 1373 from 2001. Uh, as you know, the United States, uh, as uh, the European Union, and uh, Australia and New Zealand considers uh, the ELN as a terrorist group. And that is why we uh, believe we have all the reasons to uh, put in action this uh, resolution. Um, the commanders of uh, the ELN are some of them in Cuba. Uh, two of them, the main, the main two of, of the, what we call the central command of the ELN are in Cuba and uh, the other two are in, uh, other three, I'm sorry, are in Venezuela. I'm talking about uh, alias Pablito. Pablito is the uh, most important military commander of uh, the ELN. And uh, we, are, we have confirmation that he is in uh, Venezuelan territory. And uh, our government uh, asked many times uh, the Maduro uh, dictatorship to uh, hand over the, these uh, commanders to the Interpol. We have red notices uh, for uh, the three ELN commanders that are in Venezuelan territory, and we have another two red notices uh, for the two other commanders that are in, uh, in Cuba. Uh, that is why uh, I think is the main idea uh, of, of my presentation today uh, we have a transnational uh, guerrilla, uh, talking about the ELN. We have a transnational uh, armed illegal group, and the treatment uh, for that uh, must be transnational, because uh, sometimes uh, some people think that this, this is a, a only a Colombian uh, problem, but now uh, it's not only a Colombian problem, because the ELN is transpassing the borders, he, they are using uh, uh, the territory of another country. It's like uh, ETA in, in Spain when they used uh, Spanish and French territory. And there are uh, other many examples uh, of transnational armed groups. So the treatment for a transnational problem must be a transnational solution. And uh, especially when they are using uh, narcotics, narcotraffic and illegal drugs to fuel, fuel their armies and to get financial support uh, for their armies. This is talking about the ELN. Uh, on the other side, we have what we call dissidencias, which are the, the dissidents from the peace process that uh, was signed with the FARC. The dissidencias are also uh, in Venezuela territory. They are trespassing the border all the time. And uh, we are not considering them uh, uh, as political uh, actors for a possible a peace dialogue. They are uh, criminals and they are now uh, in the process of uh, growing their business of narco traffic within Colombia and they are using Venezuela territory for do that. And on the other side, we have a new group. You, you know about them. Uh, Jesus Santrich and Ivan Marquez, they decided to um, uh, deny and to um, um, attack the peace process, they helped to negotiate, and now they are um, in the process of trying to be included in the big dissidencias. Uh, but our information is that Santrich uh, 
uh, and also Ivan Marquez, and also alias El Paisa, and also alias Romagna, uh, are in the process of trying to be included uh, as part of the dissidencias. Our knowledge is that uh, the chief commander of those dissidencias, which is Gentil Duarte, uh, is not accepting them as part of the dissidencias because they consider uh, Marquez is weak uh, because uh, he was the chief uh, negotiator uh, for the peace process with the former government. So our information is that they are trying hard to they are trying hard to uh, to be part of the of uh, of this group, but they, they are not accepting them. Uh, other big, big issue for us is immigration. Uh, we are quite open and we, are, uh, be, we have been very uh, careful and uh, very prudent to uh, receive and accept uh, Venezuelans in our country because we believe that they are, uh, we are uh, brothers countries and uh, we need uh, to support Venezuelans here. The generosity and openness of our uh, president is quite clear for the international community, so we have to uh, try very hard to strengthen in the, um, the, uh, the conditions, education, health, and etc. for for these immigrants. But we have a concern: is that these groups, these armed groups, are in the process of trying to recruit them, uh, taking profit of of, of their situation of poverty and difficulties. So for us, it's quite important also as the illegal groups that are defy, uh, trying to defy, uh, um, trying to attack or, or to destroy uh, governance in, in our country are transnational. So immigration is a, a transnational problem. This is the message. I think the most important thing is to approach this difficult issue uh, trans in a transnational uh, way uh, trying to uh, get the support of international community because this is not uh, only a Colombian problem and we need to have a different approach from a perspective of co-responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alto Comisionado. That was excellent remarks. We appreciate your, your insights. I will invite now the panelists to join me on, on the panel. We invite the Alto Comisionado to watch the event live stream as well in our, on our CSAS website. Um, before we start the panel discussion, I want to spend a couple of minutes just to put into context what the Alto Comisionado and our colleague from the Treasury and, and the Ambassador already said, right, in terms of how much presence there is in Venezuela uh, when it comes to these criminal groups. According to our own research, you see that more about half of the territory of Venezuela, there is some presence of FARC, dissidents, ELN, uh, Garimperos, other criminal groups, including Hezbollah, for example, in the North uh, Nueva Esparta state in Margarita, in, in the island of the Caribbean. Caribbean. And, 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 and again, is, again, again, see the, 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 the spread of the territory, the territory to, to the presence of these criminal groups. Um, these maps made by Inside Crime shows the activity happening in the border area, right? That's, that's a 1,300 mile border. And, and as you can imagine, the, the activity there is, 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 is happening in a, in a range of, of, of many criminal activities, right? Drug trafficking, oil trafficking, even meat trafficking or food trafficking. There's a lot of criminal activities in, the, in that area. And of course, you have the presence of ELM, FAR, the, the FARC Mafia, as some experts call it, uh, EPL, and, and other criminal groups. On this other map shows the ELM presence in Venezuela. And you see that arrow going into deep into the Amazon area in Venezuela. That's where all the illegal mining, the oil reserve are located, 
right? And that that aero area is the size of Portugal. It's, it's huge. It's a vast territory where where there's a lot of criminal activities happening, right? And and that's where uh, the importance of this discussion is is so relevant, right? Just I'm gonna I'm gonna post this PowerPoint on our website on the on the event website, but just to give you fast facts, far operates in seven states in Venezuela, about. 1,500 members are in Venezuela. Over 200 members are Venezuelan, according to Inside Crime. ELN operates in 30 states within Venezuela. Over 1,000 members operate within Venezuela, which is about 45% of ELN membership. Um, and overall, there are also 100,000 colectivos. This number is disputed. There's no consensus how many colectivos are, and, and, and more so how many arms collectivos are in Venezuela. The, the closest number I got was five to seven thousand armed collectivos and, and many more um, unarmed, but they are part of the collectivos, which is a paramilitary body that Maduro and Chavez created, right? The illegal mining uh, was is, is very important. Just to give you a quick fact, Venezuela today is the 32nd largest producer of coal in the world. But Maduro is planning to increase that production almost by three times, which will make Venezuela the second largest producer of gold in the world. About 80% of gold in Venezuela is illegal, distracted, and exported, and obviously serving as a very important source of financial um, uh, to the Maduro regime. And, and that's just a picture of how impactful uh, how the impact, the environmental impact that the illegal mining has in Venezuela. Obviously, there are social, economic, and political consequences. Many children are serving as miners in these mines in Venezuela. So again, this has very, very important ramifications of, of this crisis. But let's let's get into the panel. I think we have a top expert panel here. I'm so happy to have you, all of you guys here. Thank you so much for making this time and this effort. We're going to start with Isabel de Sainto, de Saint Malo. She was the first woman elected vice president in Panama. She was the vice president and minister of foreign affairs from 2014 and 2019 under President Juan Carlos Varela. She has an impressive background. I encourage you to take a look at, your, at her bio and all of the panelists' bio that, we, that you have with you. She's currently uh, at Harvard University as a non-resident fellow. Um, and, and so, yeah, thank you for, for coming all the way from Boston and, 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 and for being here. Isabel, I wanted to ask you how transnational organized crime and armed groups pose different security threats than domestic uh, networks, right? That, that's, I think, is an important question just to put into context the differences, what we're talking about. But thank you again for being here. Thank you so much, uh, Moises. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for, for the invitation. And more than that, for uh, CSIS to host this event and continued interest in Venezuela. Uh, we followed how CSIS looks at the humanitarian situation, the return of democracy. And I think it's very important that we continue to analyze every aspect of the Venezuelan uh, crisis as it, it is very, very complex. Well, uh, it, it is undoubted that there is a big difference when armed uh, presence is domestic or is connected to international crime. And if we could just point to the most important differences is the access to resources and intelligence. What this represents for the Venezuelan conflict is of enormous consequences. And actually, uh, the figures that you have shown um, show that it's it's a lot more complex and larger than I than I expected. This means that these groups within Venezuela not only have control of territory, but are connected to the world for financial resources, for intelligence. And the question is, what does this represent to the re possible return of democracy in Venezuela? And, and I think several things. First of all, it just makes it a lot harder for the regime to, to leave because the consequences of, of their leaving is far from losing power, is far from uh, leaving uh, power in a country. It represents that they are probably connected to situations that will take them nowhere, 
So that is a very important uh, factor. The other thing that I would raise is what this represents for the region. It has already been mentioned here uh, by Colombia, what this represents to Colombia, but I would not even speak about Colombia. I would be, speak about the region and I would speak about the world. If we know that uh, drug production has increased and uh, there is more transit of drugs from Latin America to the United States and to Europe, what does it represent that we have armed groups within Venezuela with connections to the regime that operate in connection with criminal activity globally? What does this represent for making drug trafficking easier, uh, larger? And, and we're talking about local a local situation with severe regional implications, but with severe global implications as well. And the third thing that I would point out of the presence of these groups with international uh, connections within Venezuela is what does this represent in terms of fear for the Venezuelan population. We already know that four or five million people have left Venezuela, are in the vicinity and this will continue to happen and this is probably the result not only of a humanitarian situation where there is no access to health and no access to basic uh, things but also what happens to fear there are allegations of the connections with the regime on kidnaps and 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 security risks for the population of venezuela so as the population becomes more fearful of what's going on within, when then people are just continuing to leave. And I think that just makes it harder for, for the eventual restoration of democracy to um, Venezuela because those that oppose the regime are, are, are leaving for, for, for obvious reasons. I think it's important what has been said here as well about um, asset control, and, and I think that's part of the next steps that we would have to discuss uh, further. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Dan, thank you for being here. He is the currently CEO at the International Republican Institute. You've been in IRI for, since 2009. Uh, Dan served in key positions in the U.S. government, including a special assistant to the president and senior director for Western Hemisphere Affairs on the National Security Council under President George W. Bush. Um, Dan, thank you again. This is a question that I think is re very relevant too. I, I mean, what is your assessment of the presence of transnational organized crime, including armed groups, and their impact in democracy, in governance, and, and how we think about the Venezuelan crisis in the region more broadly? Um, uh, Moises, thank you. And I extend a thank you to CSIS for inviting me to be here, I will uh, speak just as an individual, not making any um, institutional representations. I think this is uh, kind of a very fascinating question. And step back, if you think about the transition that the hemisphere has undergone since the 1980s in terms of democratization and the great progress that has been made. And generally when we've talked about democratization, political processes, uh, we've talked about kind of what one would con consider at this point conventional threats. Uh, in terms of greater opportunity for citizen participation, whether that's politically or economically, dealing with the rights of women, dealing with the rights of uh, marginalized groups, let's say indigenous populations, in the case of Lake Columbia or in other parts of the hemisphere, of course, the, the Afro-Latino populations and all those, and the importance of bringing those people into the process. What we saw with Hugo Chavez was this intentional effort to take a political ideology and combine it with criminal elements as fundamental instruments of regime control of repression, uh, combined with the general deprivation that has come along with the political philosophy uh, of Chavismo. And so that is a challenge that the hemisphere has not had to deal with. And it is one that has uh, significant implications uh, for uh, Venezuela today, uh, but also going forward, assuming that uh, the going forward, there's going to be a day after in which Venezuelans will have an opportunity reclaim direct participation in how their country is ruled and who rules them. Uh, but this goes beyond Venezuela. As my colleague uh, Isabel mentioned, uh, this is transnational. 
Uh, one of the primary targets of the criminality has been Colombia, not the only one, uh, not the only neighbor that has been impacted by this. Uh, but we see that extension, not any longer of just an ideological solidarity, but in terms of a set of activities that is nothing less than uh, just criminal activity in terms of using political, using coercion, using force to try to constrain or dictate political power for other purposes than just what we would consider the normal rule of, of, of a country. I was pleased very much to hear the ambassador uh, talk about the role of Cuba earlier, uh, how conversations have changed. Um, nice to hear some candor about Cuba's role in all of this, uh, which has just been taken as a normal political actor in the hemisphere. They are not a normal political actor. Uh, they are a pillar of Maduro. They are actually a pillar of, at this point, I would say, the criminal nature of the regime in, in Cuba. They benefit from that criminality, from that trade. Uh, so it is a matter of kind of keeping that in, in mind as well. And it's also a matter of thinking through the instruments that are, are available that uh, need to be uh, implemented, need to be deployed, as the minister said about treating this as a transnational problem in terms of all countries stepping up. It was a good move to see the European Union recently extend sanctions. They need to actually be more vigorous in terms of the extent and enforcement of those. One of the key aspects of this goes to how do you, uh, how do you keep illicit proceeds uh, and revenue as much as possible out of the international marketplace and financial uh, transactions. And one of the things that the Maduro regime uh, has done is actually be able to create these alternative avenues. You have to, if you mine gold, you have to be able to turn it into cash and make it liquid. And, and how do you do that? And they have been able to at least find some countries around the world to ally with them uh, to, to, to process that and create those revenues. And that's something that needs to be um, the governments, not just of the United States, but the governments of the hemisphere. And I go back to the Europeans, others in Asia need to step up in terms of uh, dealing with those. It also goes to the fact that we cannot overlook countries like Mexico. This isn't just an Andean issue. This go back to Central America. It's a major transit point for narcotics, narcotics which are trafficked through uh, uh, Venezuela, as the head of Southcom uh, noted last week, the increase in trafficking out of Venezuela is uh, significant. So it's a matter of maintaining a very strong engagement throughout the hemisphere with those countries that want to work with us. And at this point, there is a much larger coalition. It's also continuing to work on our neighbors in the Caribbean, uh, who at this point continue to struggle. I'll be diplomatic in my statement. Can you just struggle, struggle with kind of how to deal with Venezuela? But they need to understand that their security, their well-being is at risk if the Maduro regime is allowed to continue to exist. Thank you. That was great. Thanks. Fernando Kutz is a senior associate at the Cohen Group. Fernando previously served as a senior advisor to both National Security Advisor McMaster and General Waddell. He also served as director for South America and acting senior director for Western Hemisphere Affairs at the White House National Security Council under both administration, Obama and Trump. Uh, he served again under, yes. So a question for you, Fernando, is, is more of how the Maduro regime seeks to benefit from Venezuela's status as a hub for transnational crime and illicit activities and why this affects policymakers to respond, like why why this is different, and how we can think about responding to this crisis differently. Well, uh, uh, thank you, thank you very much, Moses, for for doing this uh, to CSIS for hosting us. Um, it's it's a very uh, it's a very tough problem, obviously, right? I mean, if there were easy solutions, we would have resolved uh, the, the crisis uh, many years ago and, and previous administrations. Uh, and and certainly, uh, when Juan and I were at the White House, we would have resolved the crisis um, uh, at that point. Uh, but but the truth is that we don't know the full extent of the illicit activity that takes place in Venezuela. Uh, and, and I think we're continuously finding out more and more of how much uh, there is. Once you start digging in, uh, once you get past that surface, uh, I think you realize just how deep this, uh, this criminal enterprise uh, goes. Uh, if you look at uh, back when, when uh, Juan and I were there in 2017, uh, we designed uh, an oil embargo, right? We never used it, but, but we, we had designed it. Uh, as part of uh, designing that, we, we tried to reach out to as many folks as we could and get estimates of what exactly the impact would have, uh, it, the impact that embargo would have on the Venezuelan economy. Uh, 
you know, I think from, from most economists we spoke to, we heard that roughly 90% of Venezuela's GDP uh, was tied to the oil sales, uh, meaning effectively that if we went through with what we had designed, 90% uh, of Venezuela's economy would be shut down. Uh, so, so we anticipated that if, if and when the U.S. government were to use that policy option, uh, we would see a, a complete devastation in Venezuela's economy. We would see some, some just real chaos, right, unleashed. Uh, and yet, a few months later, when uh, our, our successors decided to follow through on that plan and implement it, uh, we see that Venezuela's economy has actually survived, right? Uh, and so that begs the question, well, if 90% of the economy was shut down overnight, uh, uh, supposedly, you know, how is it that they are still doing, you know, as as uh, as OK as they are, as far as at least getting the bribe money out there, as, uh, keeping the corrupt officials happy? Right. Why hasn't the money dried up? Well, to answer that question, I think it's important for us to kind of go through each one of the categories that we just spoke to about how much uh, illicit activities are out there and try to ballpark about how much money might actually come from these. Now that we have a better sense, I think, uh, number one, uh, we talked about uh, money laundering. Uh, money laundering is a huge uh, part of what Venezuela's uh, regime uh, does. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of it is done through PDVSA. Now I think we, we know more and more just how much is done through PDVSA. Uh, there is an estimate that was put out by the National Defense University just a few months ago that says that as much as $4 billion a year is taking uh, of money laundering is occurring uh, and bringing that money back as profit money for uh, Maduro and that regime. Uh, so then you go to, uh, well, there's there's illicit drug trafficking, right? All the drug trafficking that goes through Venezuela. Uh, in fact, it, it, the DEA now says that uh, almost 100 percent of drugs that are trafficked from Colombia to the United States uh, through air routes, uh, those air routes go through Venezuela, almost 100%. Uh, and, and of course, more uh, land routes and, and uh, uh, even uh, naval routes are being used uh, as well. Uh, the UN estimates that about $40 billion a year of drugs go through Venezuela, ever. so $40 billion. Now, of that, let's say that they take a 10% stake, so let's say about $4 billion uh, in profit right there for uh, Venezuela. Then there's illegal mining. Uh, let's focus just on gold. Uh, they do all sorts of illegal mining, but gold is the most profitable, the largest. Uh, if you look at illegal gold mining in Venezuela, well, you, you'll see that uh, there, there's, uh, again, an ever-increasing amount happening. In fact, under uh, Maduro's plan, which uh, uh, Moises cited earlier in his PowerPoint, uh, Plan Gold, he publicly states that he would like to get uh, uh, Venezuela. In fact, he, he claims that in 2019 they achieved five billion dollars a year of uh, gold mining and gold sales now technically the official number of sales is zero because the u.s has sanctioned that uh, but let's say that uh, the truth is somewhere in the middle there uh, i'm sure maduro exaggerates but uh but let's say that he gets about you know two and a half to three billion dollars a year from illegal gold mining right now so uh you know now there's a lot of other things we're not even considering there's corruption and and how much co goes in from from the uh, food sales and humanitarian goods there's uh you know there's 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 other kinds of illegal mining, but just from what we talked about right there, just from that little sliver of illegal activities that are taking place in the economy, that's roughly what $12 billion. Uh, I was in a math major, so correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you know, so roughly $12 billion a year of illegal money that Venezuela's regime is managing to keep for itself, right? Now, those were conservative estimates and those were a, uh, a fraction probably of all of the illegal activities that are happening. So. If you, if you assume that the real number is, I don't know, 15 or maybe even more, $20 billion a year, well, that is how you sustain your economy. That is how you keep the corrupt officials happy. Uh, and, and you don't even need the oil to do it, right? So, so I think that answers our question from 17. Um, and um, uh, I won't speak for one, but I think we got it wrong, right? We, 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 were, uh, we were too optimistic in thinking that we understood their economy. We didn't understand their economy. We understood their illicit economy. That's that's a small part of their actual economy, unfortunately. So to answer your second question, Moises, of how does that impact policy? Well, uh, we can't sanction illegal money, right? It's, we, we can try to go after uh, different individuals or companies or countries that are in the process of uh, trying to acquire these illegal goods. We can try to, uh, you know, pressure different companies or countries to prevent them from acquiring illegal goods. But at the end of the day, we cannot touch money that doesn't exist officially. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it makes this process a lot harder. Um, but to end on a positive note, uh, it also opens up a new opportunity, which is 
uh, to go after these folks in the court of law. Uh, indictments, I think, are a real tool that we um, you know, talk a lot about and a lot of folks assume, well, maybe there are secret indictments out there. Uh, I hope there are, but I think it's time for the Justice Department to start actually putting those on the table. We don't have a whole lot to lose at this point. I don't think Maduro or Cabello or uh, Delcy are going to show up in Miami for a secret shopping trip anytime soon. So I think it's time for us to put our cards on the table and, in fact, go to Interpol, get red notices on these folks, make, uh, make their lives a little bit more miserable than they already are. Uh, so, so I think it opens up some policy options, but unfortunately it does close a lot of it. Thank you, Fernando. That was good. Uh, Juan Cruz, former special assistant to the president, senior director for Western Affairs Affairs at the NSC as well. He served in the early years of the Trump administration. And now we're very lucky to have him as a senior advisor at CSIS. Thank you, Juan, for your time and, and your non-compensation advice, uh, advising position with us. Uh, Juan also advises other important organizations in town, like the OEAS, IDB. Uh, but Juan, what are the ways in which the presence of what we're talking about, the legal criminal groups and all these illegal activities, affects the possibility for a transition in the country? And, and again, going to Fernando's point, what can be done by, uh, from the U.S., the interim government of Venezuela led by Juan Guaido, Colombia, and other countries to try to disrupt these criminal networks. Good morning, and, and thanks, um, Moises, and CSIS for this opportunity. I'm, a, I'm especially gratified to see Vice President Samalo here today because if we wanted to take a, 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 a best practice on how to handle some of these things, I think that Panama is, is uh, the model for that. Uh, country impacted by the transnational cross-border nature of some of these Colombian Ill illegally armed groups and the way to harness and develop a way forward. And so just to highlight those a little bit, um, you're, the first thing you need to do is to have the political will, the determination to want to take care of this. And, and uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, further why this is such a challenge. But uh, once you do that, you have to remember, especially in the case of Panama, that Panama doesn't have a military, uh, making it even more difficult for them to, to, to take on the issue. And then, of course, the, um, the matter of doctrine. What is it that you want to achieve, and how do you want to achieve it? In this case, uh, push, push out the illegally armed groups and regain your territory and free your citizens from, from the oppression of these groups and the enslavement that they conduct in your, um, in your territory. And to do that, you have to build your forces through uh, good training, capability, and equipping. And to, and to do all that, uh, takes a special political courage because the fact is that as happened in Panama and will happen in Venezuela the day after, you're not going to start off with successes. You're probably going to have a few failures and you have to have the political courage to work through those failures, learn from them so that you can eventually get to a situation where you can claim um, success and uh, push back these organizations. And in fact, I would even offer that it's an opportunity like this for countries like Panama with their success on a day after scenario to offer advice and maybe even training and assistance to um, uh, a new Venezuelan uh, government to harness uh, their forces against these illeg uh, legally armed groups. And what we find in, uh, in a place like Venezuela is quite honestly a kaleidoscope of of crime and insurgency. Um, one that is, uh, I'd like to put a sort of a fine point on this, it's generational. Uh, this did not happen uh, overnight uh, under Chavismo. And in fact, if you recall, uh, we have a generational issue with the ELN where we have ELN communities that have been there. Um, and what I mean communities, I mean you know villages and children and families and, and, and organizations. They're very akin to you know, any other normal village on that side of the border. Um, and that predates Chavismo. And you'll recall that in those days, the central government recognizing the, the, uh, the, the threat, maybe not in the same form that it exists today, but certainly one that was um, um, a threat against the central government, the military in Venezuela at that time superimposed a theater of operations over the normal military uh, regions. So what you had was theater of operation one and theater of operation two, saddling the border, those areas between uh, Venezuela and Colombia so they could put special resources, special units and special attention, particularly against the ELN, but also against the FARC. Now that was all done away with in the early 
Chavez years, of course, but the, the idea was it, that's a recognition of the enormity of the problem and, and the fact that that problem predates Chavismo. So you have these well-entrenched uh, communities with roots, and there is, and in their view, they're as much Venezuelan as they are Colombian. Uh, they don't know any other any other life. And if you add to that, um, you know, the, the FARC uh, presence in the region, while not as in, uh, while not as a complete and family-oriented, let's say, as the ELN, is certainly one that we can go back to some very revealing uh, tapes that President Uribe uh, displayed uh, before the world community uh, in 2010 where uh, it was evident that the FARC now had these rather elaborate military camps well entrenched, well established within Venezuelan uh, soil. And then we can go to uh, other sorts of today dissidents from the um, National Liberation Army, the EPL, and even though the uh, Colombians were able uh, to uh, uh, f finally dar de baja megateo who uh, was an especially uh, heinous character on the border, the remnants and dissidents from that organization that no longer hold an ideological flag still have an impact, and of course, drug trafficking organizations, rastrojos, and those sorts of things. So um, in the day after scenario, we're gonna have to prioritize this kaleidoscope. Not every organization demands the kind of attention that you would assume in the early days. I think in, in some, what you've seen is a Herculean task. It's one that's going to demand um, uh, attention from not just Ven a new Venezuela, but uh, the surrounding countries in the region. It has been said earlier. Uh, we can expect, as often happens, the, the partnering of these uh, bad actors. Even today, it's hard to distinguish between what's the official line of the Maduro regime and what's uh, the policies and, of the FARC and the ELN. And, uh, and this enormous, daunting task, how do we get at it? The same way you eat a cow, one bite at a time. Thank you, Juan. Great. Uh, let's go back to Isabel and Dan. Isabel, uh, Juan put the, the, the point that Panama has been a key ally for, you know, the, the, to free Venezuela and to restore democracy. Um, can you share with us your insights of what Panama can do more on, to help Venezuela on this process and, and more broadly the region, right? What, what are the gaps that you see that we can do more to, to disrupt these criminal activities happening in Venezuela from the Panamanian point of view? Then Fernando mentioned the, the issue of indictments. Um, and you said that, you know, Maduro and Cuba, the, the Castro regime, are now normal political actors, right? These are organized criminal governments who are working together. Uh, so in your view, what else, so what other policy tools do we have in the toolkit that we can use to, again, increase pressure on Maduro and, and support the Venezuelan people in this very important moment? But going back to you, Isabel. Thank you, Moises. Transnational crime collaborates, and they are unfortunately many times faster than governments are to respond. Uh, but if they collaborate and that strengthens them, there is no way of addressing this unless governments collaborate. That, that is central. And I think that has been happening. That needs to continue to happen in terms of sanctions, in terms of sharing of intelligence, in terms of having a, a, a united front. And I think 2019 has been a year after uh, uh, the recognition of uh, President Guaido as legitimate president of, of Venezuela uh, has been a year where we have seen some of that back and forth and we definitely need uh, this collaboration to be firmer and more and more steady. I was thinking of what happened when Panama was under a military dictatorship many years ago when Noriega was in power. At the time, we, we forget, it was, it was a long time ago, maybe some people here were not even born, but it was not that long ago. And we forget that Panama was without a financial system, without banks for a long time. And assets from the Panamanian government within this country were frozen. And those assets were placed at the disposition or, or part of it 
of the Panamanian opposition. And that was very important in aligning the Panamanian opposition and in making it possible to strengthen the fight to recuperate democracy in Panama. Along the lines of what has been said here, General Noriega was indicted. I'm not making a comparison. There are different situations, different countries, different times. But it's something that's there that is relevant to look at and analyze today with the reality today, and there are many differences. Are there some policy, policies that were taken at the time that are relevant today? Can they be done today? And I, and I see the point of uh, legal flows and illicit flows, but it's not the only time that governments have had to fight and identify illicit flows. We, today, are more empowered and have more tools on our side to fight against that than we had then. Because those, that's a reality uh, today. So I think that, that in terms of policy, collaboration is of the essence that has been happen, happening, but I, need, I think it needs to continue to strengthen. And I also agree with Fernando that we need to identify other, other policy um, uh, situations and, and, and exchange of, of, of intelligence. I, I, I did have the feeling, I must say, while in office, that coordination was not ideal. And I'm talking about coordination within Venezuelan uh, opposition, coordination outside of Venezuela for those countries that were trying to help. There was, there was a lot of surprise. And I understand that surprise sometimes is necessary. But surprise also undermines the possibility of you preparing and supporting. And we all know the difficulties to government. It's not like you can jump and make decisions spur of the moment. You need to look at what uh, laws allow you to do, do not allow you to do. There are steps and, 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 and different, um, different institutions within a government that would need to make part of a decision. These things take time. These things don't happen one minute to the next. And I do remember many times while in office finding out about things on the news. And I get it that for surprise, it's not like you're going to have a Congress to align and collectively design next step. But it really doesn't help when, when, when information is not shared. And I think that's an issue there that needs to be put on the table as well in terms of policy making for the future. It's not only policy making, it's policy making and to make it happen, we need to have everybody around the table and different countries have different legislations and, and it's, it, we, we cannot all act on the same lines, but if we coordinate, we can find ways. And I'm not in office anymore, so that won't be my responsibility anymore, but I am sharing this as a, what, uh, what we went through because I think it's relevant for the future. So kind of along those lines, I'll first quip that, you know, when you leave, uh, when you leave an official position, um, you all of a sudden have all the answers. Um, somehow you never had when you were in government. But uh, I've uh, actually learned um, that's not the case. Uh, one of the challenges in terms of the policy uh, is quite often uh, policymakers are asked to manage contradictions and manage competing priorities. Uh, that's stating the obvious. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it becomes a very real set of parameters when looking at a situation like Venezuela. Um, if, uh, to kind of uh, key off of Fernando's comment, if it, indictments were the magic formula, um, then um, bring them on. Um, and if one had the presumptuous uh, belief that 
uh, the U.S. indictment uh, could alone affect a change, uh, then all the more reason to have that mechanism uh, used on that. Uh, I think they're, um, they're important. Um, what the indictments did in the case of Panama, if I can just play off that, is actually, as much as anything, changed the debate in the United States. It said to Americans that the U.S. had a different interest in Panama and had to act. I think one of the situations with Venezuela is there's political consensus on what the challenges with Venezuela are, who that problem is. Um, this is bipartisan. Um, this is between the House and the Senate. Um, so, you know, you don't really find many voices. There are still some, uh, there are many voices um, defending uh, Maduro uh, or um, anyone around him in that. Uh, this really comes down to an issue of resources um, and political will, to play off what Juan said, and political will not only in Washington, um, but also, again, I go back to what I said at opening in terms of earlier, uh, earlier remarks about uh, political will in other capitals. Uh, if you're going to cut off uh, financial flows, then we're going to have to talk about a conversation probably about Turkey. Um, this may be a little different than what we've had. There may be some conversations about countries in West Africa that need to be had in terms of their reported uh, points, uh, transit for either drugs, gold, or, or resources uh, back, um, back to Venezuela. Um, there are other actors in the world uh, in which uh, the conversation, again, may have to take on uh, some different attributes than it, than it currently has. And then what's the priorities we give to those, uh, those interactions, given the other range or given the range of bilateral interests we have with, say, some of the countries uh, I've mentioned or the regions uh, I've mentioned in that. And that is, is really one of the, the key challenges. I think, to its credit, the Trump administration has made a very vigorous effort to uh, try to create these coalitions uh, and to work with a number of countries around the world uh, to advance uh, political change uh, in Venezuela. Uh, and, and so they, they've clearly built, uh, they, the Trump administration clearly built on a lot of good work by predecessors, but nonetheless, that it's, it's there. It's a matter of kind of us not just us alone deploying uh, assets uh, and strengthening uh, what the vice president said in terms of strengthening coordination, intelligence sharing, uh, deploying assets, uh, as we have done in, say, the, the Caribbean at times to interdict uh, drug flows. Uh, also working with countries to provide them with the wherewithal uh, to be able to strengthen their internal capabilities. And in the case of what I will now call the frontline states to Venezuela, um, their capabilities um, to, to deal with the situation uh, along their respective borders and all of that. So, you know, again, I, I, I really think that all of us have struggled with kind of what is the, what is the formula. Um, more of the same um, it's going to be, but it's a matter of kind of how that gets turned up and what other interests are we willing to put on some kind of hold uh, to kind of affect the change that we need to stop the illicit flows. Uh, Fernando outlined, I think, uh, a, very, uh, a very strong case of why Maduro and his structure around him can continue to survive with all the sanctions that we have in place uh, on legitimate uh, economic transactions. So it's a matter of how to go after the illicit or the illegal. We know how to do that. And I say we, not just the United States, but the international community. There are mechanisms out, mechanisms out there. It's beyond red notices, uh, but those become an important aspect of this if countries will actually act on those notices. And so I think that, again, is what, uh, what the big open question remains. I understand. Um, F Fernando, going back to you, I mean, the, the High Commissioner Sevai just mentioned that this is a transnational problem, and therefore we need a transnational solution. So on the same line as Dan and Isabel and Juan and yourself, right, like what else is there on the policy toolkit in the region? But more specifically, I know, I know you were around when the Lima Group was formed, right, and, and this is more or less unprecedented. For the first time we have a group of important countries, although some countries were losing some countries, gaining others. Um, is this is the Lima group enough, or is this an effort that should be more broad, more looking at other allies in, the, in Europe, what the Europeans should be doing on this issue, what um, is, is there a role for Asian countries, um, and, and more broadly, right? It's, it's because this is, again, this is becoming a global issue. I mean, Venezuela will easily turn 
into the, mo the country with most refugees in the war by 2020 if the status quo continues. So in a way, the mindset will have to be changing. And how do you see that mindset changing and what, what other countries in the world should be doing about this? Yeah, well, you know, first of all, I just want to completely agree with the vice president, with Dan. Uh, you know, multinationalism is a, is a huge, important component of uh, getting to any kind of resolution. Uh, I don't think we're going to do this alone. Um, moreover, I'd say sanctions, uh, you know, I don't, can't speak for, for since uh, for, for, for really anything, but I'll say for myself, um, I don't think I would ever imp uh, recommend imposing sanctions as a tool to bring about regime change, right? I don't think sanctions alone uh, bring about regime change. Uh, it's never been done, uh, and uh, nor, nor do I think it, it can be done. Uh, sanctions are a tool to create momentum. Uh, to then bring the other side to the negotiating table and hopefully uh, give, uh, in this case, the opposition or, or you know, the Gaido administration uh, at least an equal footing when they show up to that table, right? So that's, that's why you do sanctions. So I uh, also want to be clear about that. But uh, to the broader point about what policy tools do we have, what multinational um, uh, route is there, um, yeah, I think the Lima Group was absolutely a historic uh, occurrence, as you said, Moises. That that was uh, incredible uh, for all of us to see. Right, uh, the the region came together uh, in a way that uh, we frankly all doubted was possible uh, against one of its own, uh, and they spoke out vocally and loudly against one of its own, uh, and and they um, embraced the the aspects of the OAS Democratic Charter. Uh, and they and they did all these things that you you all always hope that countries will do, but uh, unfortunately, frequently are disappointed uh, by by uh, not for whatever reason, bureaucratic or otherwise, that they don't do. Um, so it was fantastic. It was fantastic for when it started, though. Uh, I think in 2017 to see that all come together and to see the statements that were being made, that was amazing. And that's all we needed back then. Uh, unfortunately, that's kind of where it stopped. Uh, you know, as things continued to progress and 18 came along and now 19, uh, we needed more than just kind of words, right? We needed more than just these vague uh, promises. Uh, and unfortunately, the Lima Group never went beyond those vague promises and words, right? We never saw action. We never saw concrete uh, um, uh laws passed in countries that would allow for sanctions to be taken against Venezuela or Venezuelan officials in different countries. Now, Panama was an exception. Panama actually did phenomenally well, uh, more so than I think any other country. Uh, Col Colombia, of course, was also um, uh, helpful. But for the most part, Latin American countries tend to rely on this talking point they use with us, which is, well, our laws don't allow us. You know, Now, we, we see constitutions change every few years in Latin America. I'm sure they can pass a law that allows them to uh, sanction uh, Venezuela or Venezuelan officials if, if they so chose. Uh, but uh, we, we're not seeing that effort and we're not seeing that concrete, uh, concrete uh, follow up to the Lima Group. Uh, is the Lima Group enough? Uh, no, we need a, a global approach, no doubt about it. But the Lima Group's an important part of it because I think when you look at Europe and when you look at other places around the world, they care less about Venezuela, right? They, that's just self-interest, national interest. Why would they care so much about Venezuela? It's far away from them. They don't buy a whole lot. They don't need it. Uh, so, so they care about it in the vague human rights way, but you, you have to usually have a little bit more to get a country to want to uh, really engage in something than just like you know vague human rights. Um, uh, so uh, that's usually the region, and that's where the Lima Group can step in, right? If the Lima Group representing the region is vocal and they say, we as the region are asking for help on this, that goes a long way towards getting the Europeans, towards getting the United Nations, uh, towards getting anybody else to, to care and want to engage on Venezuela. Now, as the region continues to churn uh, at the moment and, and uh, becomes very unclear as to who is who and uh, where in the ideological spectrum anyone falls at any given moment, um, it's, it's important for us to remember that we did have a historic alignment in 17 and 18 and most of this year, uh, and we all knew that was going to go away. Right. Part of the pressure and making that be the moment was, of course, the people were out in the streets. Of course, Maduro was acting in a worse way, but also that incredible alignment in the region. Uh, and, uh, you know, chances are that will go away. Uh, and, and so uh, we might need to develop new strategies and new policies and new international uh, coalitions. Uh, but, uh, but the truth is, again, it, it has to be based on action, not just vague promises. Thanks, Fernando. Okay, last question before we open it up for, for the audience, uh, and it's for you, Juan, and it's about the day after in Venezuela, right? Like, 
what are the implications of, of the presence of armed groups in Venezuela when, if Venezuela restored its democracy? Because these groups are going to still physically there <laughs> and whatever government comes in will have to deal with these groups. And I'm talking not only about ELN and FARC, but also colectivos, um, you know, other criminal organizations, which many are part of the government itself in different ministers, in different agencies and, and, and institutions. So it's a huge challenge for Venezuela, not only for, for an economic, social, political point of view, but from a security point of view. Uh, and I know you have been, you know, thinking about this issue for about the day after, and, and so we're eager to hear your thoughts on this. <laughs> <laughs> so for the next seven hours, I'll be reviewing the... Uh, uh, maybe I'll take it from a, you know, sort of narrow this a little bit, because, you know, going back to one of the points I made, you, you have to pursue those uh, threats to national security that, uh, first of all, are a threat to... Uh, stability and to governance of the central government. You're going to have whatever new government rolls in is immediately going to have to um, uh, gain fast roots and uh, stiffen their resolve because they're going to start receiving criticism and worse from, from the very beginning, from various sectors. Um, that, and you have to, um, you know, before we want to rebuild Venezuela, and to rebuild Venezuela, we've already heard that it's going to as a transnational issue, all countries are going to have to uh, participate in some form. But um, what you're going to have is um, an, enormous, an, an enormous challenge that's going to take everyone's um, vote and, and participation. But for, to rebuild the country, you're going to have to establish, uh, provide for the very best stability so that foreign com foreign um, investment, foreign companies, foreign technology, and locals can operate to help rebuild the electric infrastructure and the, and, um, and the water system and all these things, and to operate, establish themselves and operate in the most basic of ways. And if you can't ensure their security, then that's never going to happen. So that becomes rapidly day one, number one. And uh, my advice to the uh, interim government is that's where you want to invest a lot of your your time and effort uh, right now and not um, what you're going to do about the FARC. Uh, the implications is also are is that the, the people now are living under a, a oppressive crime. And so it's going to demand a new approach in public security, which we haven't talked about today and we haven't had the opportunity to talk about. But, you, you know, it's tough to just live in Venezuela today. And even if you have very little, someone else wants it. And uh, so we're going to have to provide for a, a better basic public security. And, um, and then maybe just to add to something um, that, that Dan said, uh, referring to the comments of our commander of Southcom, Admiral Craig Fowler, who said, you know, who's talking about these uh, vast networks and the and the aerial tracks coming out of Venezuela, which are scary, the spider web of activity. Uh, but we have to remember that Venezuela is a tran uh, transit country. So whatever happens narcotics related in Venezuela is coming from somewhere else, whether it's Bolivia or Peru or Colombia. And it has a nexus, whether it's going to West Africa or um, to the uh, Western Caribbean, Eastern Central America. That means that um, we're going to rely on something that was said not only by the commissioner and Fernando, but by the vice president, which is we're all going to have to collaborate. We're all going to have to share more intelligence. And we're all going to have to do a little more than what's being done now to be able to cut off these sources of financing, which the uh, legally armed groups and the narcotics traffickers, and who are also the ones that are going to uh, be corroding the self sense of confidence in the country. And it's exactly the opposite of what we need to rebuild in Venezuela. Thank you, Juan. Okay, great. Thank you all. You've been very patient. Um, if you have a question, please just raise your hand, say your name, say your institution. And remember the question always ends with a question mark. So, um, Let's go here first, then we have on the back, we have one here, and then we go to the other aisle. So let's, do, let's take two, three questions at the, at the same time. One here, and then Maria on the 
middle here, Keith Pines. Um, just raise your hand again, Keith. There. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Piotr from SICE. I just love asking questions. So um, we've talked a lot about sanctions. Um, and that was what I was spending a fair amount of my time studying at SICE. And um, the thing about what's going on in Venezuela is the amount of unintended consequences. And we're talking about the long term. And I feel that, well, we were kind of reaching, the momentum has stalled. And I feel that it's prob probably better, wouldn't you think, to engage with not just our allies, but those who are also incredibly important on the other side with Russia and China, because unless you're more willing to make compromise, the sanctions are only one policy tool, but diplomacy is equally important. Whether or not you agree with the uh, you know, other side, Maduro, it's still a power struggle. And until you confront that, which is a systemic problem, uh, you're not going to fully tackle alongside the transit rate and um, sources of drugs. Uh, you're not going to tackle a fundamental problem with the Venezuelan uh, crimin criminal activity. So just curious to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Question, thank you. Okay, let's go in the middle. Yeah, hi. Uh, Keith Myers, the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, I was trying to get jazzed up last night for this session by watching the last episode of Jack Ryan, but uh, I, I fell asleep before it ended, so I don't know if it has a happy ending or not. You toggle back and forth between the day of what we need to do with armed groups now to, to shut off their revenue to the regime and try to put pressure on the regime and the day after. It seems like today we're kind of stuck because the revenue is flowing from all sorts of places. It's also flowing from uh, remittances and the semi-dollarization of the economy. I think we're just stuck, frankly, but there may be something to be done there. But, but in any event, the day after especially, it seems like there's a need for a new player. And I just wondered if you've thought about, both for the day of and the day after, uh, the role that the UN could play. And the day after, I certainly don't see how this is ever going to get sorted out without a, a strong uh, mission of some sort that would put out some, uh, some forces in the field to help with the transition and getting these groups under control. But even today, it seems like there's more of a role for the UN than they have been given credit for. Thank you. One more question on the back, Brian. Hi, Brian Butcher with Shell Oil Company. Uh, thanks, Moises and CSS, for a great panel. Thanks, panelists. One issue that hasn't been raised is the Army, uh, the security forces writ large, uh, Army, National Guard, and uh, police. We've got examples in history of uh, Panama in 1889, uh, Germany in 1945, and uh, Iraq in 2003. So if anybody could comment on how you sort that out, uh, given their probable alignment, with a lot of these uh, illegal armed groups. Thanks. OK, we have three good questions on the table. Um, feel free to, uh, you want to start, Isabel? OK. Just a couple of thoughts. Um, on the day after, and I, I just want to highlight what Juan said regarding security, and, and he's an expert at that, of course. But um, as that would be great to be planning for the day after and, and be executing it uh, soon. But um, what happens to a country where you have such a large part of a territory controlled by foreign uh, illegal groups? And what will this represent for the day after and the possibilities of investment arriving in Venezuela and, and the economy um, happening? I, again, I, I would think that this is an issue where Venezuela will need a lot of support, particularly where the armed forces stand today. And I don't know in terms of security how that is shaped, but that is something that will definitely be need to look at. I think that the mention of the UN is very, very relevant. I know the IGB has been working on, on the day after. And I, IDB, UN, other countries, there will be space for everybody. Uh, if and when we are on the minute of um, executing the day after plan in, in uh, Venezuela. But I would like to mention another experience. The gentleman here was talking about different uh, experiences regarding the armed forces. And this is something that has been mentioned before, but I don't know if, if, if uh, uh, carefully enough. What happened when the transition took place in Poland? And at that point in time, the armed forces played a role and had a space and had a voice 
in a transition of a period of time. If the armed forces are part of the illegal activity happening within Venezuela, and this will represent for them many things which are making them want to stay, for sure. If there is a solution for a change, is it possible in Venezuela to have a situation like there was in Poland, where there is some sort of transition that gives some space for those that are making it possible for the regime to stay today? Because the armed forces is making it possible for the regime to stay today. And they have not a lot to lose. They have everything to lose. So if we don't give a way out, why are they going to allow for a change? So I think on the day after, not only the economic security, but then again back to the political possible solutions to the problem. And, and there are many, many others that need to be looked at. Very important point. Thank you. Thanks, Sam, for bringing that up. Any other comments yet, Sam? Uh, just a couple of thoughts here. Um, and none of us speak for this administration, but my impression is that there has been interaction with the Russians and the Chinese uh, by the um, representatives of Juan Guaido and also by the, the U.S. government in terms of discussions on, uh, on, on, on Venezuela and kind of how those play out. Um, is anyone's guess at this point? I'm assuming not just in Washington, Moscow, but in Beijing as well on that. Um, I think one of the, the things everyone struggles with going back to this kind of day after question, uh, is um, to get to that point, as we've seen in any other number of circumstances around the world, there's kind of like what one would might want to see from the moralistic ideal point of view, and then the reality of kind of how do you reach um, some kind of modus vivendi. When you're talking about the military, and the, there's many examples out there, and uh, the vice president just raised another one, um, in terms of kind of how do you basically keep the Venezuelan military, I would put it, in the barracks, uh, allow to allow a transition, recognizing that they have had this uh, other role uh, directly in the policy process, but also in terms of how corrupted the institution has become, at least at, at senior levels. And there may be that scenario where people are just going to have to really swallow some unpleasant um, situations uh, to kind of create some space for there to be a day after. Uh, whether that's through the UN um, or some kind of other ad hoc arrangement, uh, possibly under some inter-American uh, declaration or parameters is, I think, an, an interesting question. I think, though, we also get into this of why now we have a humanitarian situation in Venezuela that is significant, and whether or not there should be discussion now about uh, humanitarian zones. Are those under blue helmets? Are those um, And are those within what would be recognized as Venezuelan uh, sovereign territory, um, but under the direction of the legitimate constitutional government, that of interim president Guaido. Uh, and I think those are questions that should be on the table right now, and that may also help then lay some groundwork for what I do think will be eventually a day after, um, and um, look at that process right now of kind of trying to begin to build some, some structures and signals that there are elements within the Maduro structure uh, the Chavista structure um, that actually will have some place the day after as well. Thank you. Any, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, quickly on, on the Russia-China front, uh, of course, completely agree. Uh, but, but I think, a, as we said earlier, uh, sanctions are not a tool that lead to a conclusion themselves, right? Sanctions are a tool that helps you get to uh, a, a, a tool that can get you to a conclusion, which is usually diplomacy and usually negotiations. Um, so, so I think sanction, it's, I don't think it's either or, I think it's, it's both. You need the sanctions or, or whatever creative new tool we can come up with that will allow the opposition uh, the, the chance to be in an even playing field with, with Maduro. Um, as for the UN's role, uh, no doubt, Keith, uh, of course we're going we're, we're gonna to need everybody, right? I mean, we, we all know the numbers that, that, that are estimated out there. It's probably worse than those numbers, right? I, I hear 30 to $50 billion dollars. Um, uh, within the first couple of years. Well, you know, where is that money going to come from? That's, that's a key question, right? People think the World Bank or the IMF or the U.S. government or other governments. At the end of the day, we're not in a, in a time period in this world where 
governments are feeling particularly generous. Uh, you know, governments are, are being held to account by their own people uh, and, and for, for tax increases, for three cent increases on Metro, right, for, for all sorts of things. Uh, and we're seeing governments have to uh, not just look internally more and more to spend their money, but also be more and more frugal with their money. So I, uh, you know, of course, we've, we've talked about how bipartisan an issue Venezuela is, and unfortunately, uh, that's mainly been able to stay the, the case. Uh, and I'm sure that there will be a bipartisan and push uh, through Congress uh, for new money to be sent to Venezuela when there is a day after. But I wouldn't expect that to be $20 billion, right? Or 15 or 10 or five, right? Maybe it's a billion or two. Uh, maybe it's going to be loan guarantees like we did with Ukraine. Uh, it's not going to be a ton of money. And if the United States of America isn't going to give a ton of money, then I guarantee you that nobody else in the world will, right? We're always the leaders in humanitarian uh, uh, aid. Uh, and again, and I think we're the most impacted of the Europeans or the Asian countries there. So uh, will the World Bank come through? Will the IMF come through? Of course, they're going to each have their packages. The UN will have to come through. But even then, it won't be enough. And the solution is going to have to come in the end of the day from the people of Venezuela and from the private sector, which I think will have a lot of room to grow there. Uh, the, the last point on the uh, what do you do with the army um, uh, from Brian, uh, you know, um, that's going to be a tough, tough problem. Uh, I think one of the two key problems that the, the, the government is going to have in the day after is what do you do with all the security for? And it's not just the army, right? There's the illegal, the, the, the motorcyclists with guns, right? I think that's an even perhaps bigger problem uh, because I think they, they actually buy into some of the uh, Maduro nonsense. Uh, whereas I think the army probably knows better, but they just, they, they want to get paid, right? So, so you need to figure out how you're, who, who's, the, who are the really bad people that you can't interact with that need to go to jail, that need to pay the, the price? Uh, and who are the, the vast majority of people that you need to just move on and, uh, and, and kind of bring along? And that's going to be a very tough issue. The second, I think, really tough issue uh, is going to be uh, how the new administration, how the new president survives beyond a few months. Uh, because, um, you know, I think people will be understanding at first uh, and they will give the new president space at first uh, saying, OK, you know, austerity measures. OK, things will get worse. Uh, but that will only last a little while. Right. People's patience runs thin. And I think people probably think in their mind that, you know, patience is like six months and then things will start getting better. <laughs> and uh, truth is, I think things will get much, much worse once uh, the admin a new president is actually responsible with the way they're spending the people's money. Uh, and austerity measures will be severe. Uh, and chances are that within six months to a year, the people will say, you know what? We had it better under Maduro's days, you know? And so how do you survive uh, in a democratic establishment, uh, small d, right? Wh uh, how do you make that happen? Uh, that'll be another major challenge. Thank you. Juan, any quick comments on all of these issues? I'm, I'm debating whether to say anything or not because uh, I, I'm, I want to be the contrarian here. And I, maybe I'll add uh, two points. One on the issue of the UN. I don't know what leads us to believe that the UN is going to provide some sort of solution when we've had the US, individual countries, the OAS, a group of Lima, the Norwegians, the international contact group. And I've never seen a situation that gets resolved by throwing more and more opinions into the table. And I, I, I'm, I'm actually against that. I think we should resolve the issue um, uh, in the region, and it can be done. There's no magic wand that the UN is going to bring to this. And even their WASTA from the UN is I, I'm very suspect. I don't think that's a winner. I think the UN has a situation where the, the, they've played very well in the, in the realm of human of the issue of human rights, and the, but they've come up short on the issue of, of migrants. The, if the UN wants an opportunity to, to, to contribute something, why don't they contribute something that's been underfunded and, and has an, a lack of attention like the migrant issue? Um, and uh, rather than, than opening it up for uh, a full contact support with the UN in there as well. And on the issue of the Army, I know it's very device, divisive. I've said it before. The, the uh, Venezuelan military absolutely has a vote. And they have, uh, and they, and they have a, a role to play in this. And uh, and if they know how to play it smartly, um, more of them will be able to stay and avoid um, uh, negative repercussions. And the longer they wait, it's going to be trickier. And uh, again, I know people uh, love to say that there are no comparisons. I think. They, they need to probably look deeper into the issues, but their comparisons uh, with Panama on this, there are places to get it wrong, like Iraq, and places to get it right, like Panama. And, um, and it was 30 years ago, December 19th.
Thank you. Okay, let's do a last round of questions. I, I have Herbert on the line here. Um, any other person that wants to make it? Yeah, Pedro Borelli. So one here, Maria, um, they're both close. Jaime, if you don't mind giving the microphone to Pedro here in the middle. Okay, sorry. So we can wait. Herbert. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I like to hear a panel's opinion on um, the state of uh, understanding by the uh, political um, leadership here in, in, in the states of the magnitude of the threats uh, that you know the situation in Venezuela represents for, for the entire region, including, of course, the United States. Um, if you were you know, uh, to refer to that in terms of um, how well, how uh, deep uh, they, they understand uh, what may be happening in the coming years uh, on one side, uh, to what extent they would be willing to include that in every, every uh, agenda of their multilaterals or negotiations or meetings with Russia, China, Turkey, etc. And my, the related question is, um, what recommendation would you make to the Venezuelan opposition in terms of helping to uh, in, in you know to that uh, uh, to this political leadership here to to understand that uh, what mistake or have been made or or what effort are not being made that need to be made by the white uh, government in, in helping to bring the political leadership here understand the magnitude of the threat. Thank you, thanks, Herbert. Just pass the microphone on the other side here. Yes. And last question, Pedro. Hi, I'm Pedro Burelli. I'm actually just really taking off from Herbert Torres's question is, when we talk about the Group of Lima, and, and I agree with Fernando and, and Vice President San Malo was very active uh, as, as a foreign minister also of Panama. Um, it worked for a long time, and none of this discussion entered into that. I mean, you look at every single one other declarations, and there's probably now 20 something declarations from the Group Lima. They never described this problem. Um, Norway is having discussions with two parties the government, uh, illegal government, the, the usurper, and the legitimate government. But they're not bringing in all these elements. I mean, the Colombian peace plan, which in the regions were very involved, involved the government and the illegal guys who are occupying part of the territory, making life quite difficult. So, how long can we go on with an international community? that is actually focused on the wrong problem in Venezuela and wishing for things. I mean, everybody wants Maduro to leave today, but I'm not sure even the United States has a plan of how to support Guaido tomorrow to stay in power, to do those early things that, that, that Juan Cruz was, was mentioning about. I don't think this plan exists. So are we in a delusional kind of environment where a problem uh, that is growing in size and it's actually growing because of sanctions as explained by, by Paul Iron, that the more sanctions there is, the more illegality there exists. And we actually continue to focus about diplomatic and electoral solutions and stuff like that when we're actually diverging from that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we have two, three questions. <laughs> uh, feel free to jump in on that. But just, just a, a reminder, we have about three minutes left, so just make it very quick, maybe one minute each, if you don't mind. Um, I'll start first. Uh, I'll, I'll tread this first. Um, liking to think I'm not being deluded. Um, I, you know, the first question, political leadership. I do think that there is recognition by the political leadership um, in the political branches on um, the threat that Venezuela poses to the region, to the United States. Uh, the magnitude of that, I think, um, how they assess the magnitude of that is going to be, you ask 535 individual members and you'll get 635 different opinions. I think Congress took an important step last week with this formation of a Venezuela caucus. Um, now, in some cases, that is simply symbolic, but the fact that some members of Congress, again, bipartisan, came together to at least put some more attention on Venezuela. Uh, if you look at the mechanics of our government, that's a positive step. It's not going to resolve uh, 
the disconnects in U.S. policy, but it becomes an important piece. This is where the Venezuelan opposition, or let me say, the representatives of the constitutional Venezuelan government um, need to have more of a presence, I think, in not just Washington, but a number of capitals around the world. They need to make sure that they're getting their message out, that they are describing to people what is the day-to-day -day reality uh, of um, the situation in Venezuela, and also what it means for the region. I think the Colombians have done a phenomenal job on their own. Uh, now, clearly, they put attention uh, upon the impact, uh, Venezuela's impact on Colombia, as they well should, because they are bearing the brunt of it. Um, but from what I see, uh, I see more Colombian uh, messaging and trying to put attention on at least the humanitarian circumstance um, than I see from the Venezuelan opposition, as well intentioned as they um, as, as they may be. Pedro, to go to your, your question, um, I think one of the challenges that uh, we have um, from the U.S. government perspective is that Venezuela, because of the criminality, doesn't kind of fit the paradigm. And as the joke goes, the paradigm is worth 20 cents. Um, so you have a situation now in which, you know, we've been dealing with kind of traditional political, traditional diplomatic. We can deal with counterinsurgency, but this kind of constellation um, uh, is, is something that people don't know how to deal with um, because, again, we deal with everything in it's the term is silos, right? What does DEA do versus what Southern Command does versus what the State Department does? Uh, it's not that they don't come together, it's just they have their perspective. And I think from a U.S. Pers from a U.S. vantage point, this is one of those that several administrations have struggled with of how to have this whole of government approach that is genuinely that. I don't think in any way it's delusional. I think it is just a matter of the, the, the mechanisms that we've had to deploy up to this point or have been willing to deploy up to this point have kind of created some limitations. I think one of the questions that the United States will face in the next year, because I, my own view is that this can't continue. I actually think at this what happens now is Maduro has to become far more repressive than they already are, invisibly so, to be able to do away with this nuisance from his point of view, which is Guaido and the opposition, and consolidate power, which would be really the ultimate Cubanization of Venezuela. At that point, then, what are the instruments that we have available in the United States to deal with that, and also in, in, in the region? And so I, I think we're going to get to that point. Uh, in the, over the next 12 months in terms of kind of what those are. And those actually, we have to realize, may turn out to be acquiescence in how Venezuela goes as opposed to what some of us think should be the course, which is a very different Venezuela. Thank you, Dan. Any last comments, Isabel, Fernando, um, Juan? Okay, I think we have a great discussion today. I have key points done, I think summarize it really well. Uh, but this is a transnational problem, right? And we need to find solutions on the transnational spectrum. I do wanna recognize that we, we CSIS recognize that this is uh, the gender inequality in this panel. We're making concrete steps to remedy this problem in, in CSIS, so we, we wanna recognize that. But thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all the panelists and everybody to join us.